All right, we're recording. Okay. All right, we are on in three, two. Com. And with me today, I have apologist extraordinaire Sam Shamoon. I've uh, I've had him on for an interview before. Sam deals mainly with Islamic apologetics, and um, I uh, I had an interview with him back. I think it was August, and we uh, talked a lot about. Um, uh, it was kind of an introduction to Islamic apologetics. So if you're new to Islamic apologetics, you may want to go check that video now we're going to be dealing with some more advanced topics here so uh it's good to check that video first but after that come right here uh sam how are you uh praise the lord jesus christ thank you for having me it's an honor to serve you for the sake of jesus and i just want to real quickly ask the father of our lord jesus to bless us by the power of his holy spirit and that by the spirit to guide this conversation to speak truth without error to glorify jesus christ the beloved son of the father with the intention that this will be used by the grace of the Spirit to bring Muslims out of the darkness of Islam and to the feet of Jesus. In Jesus' name, we love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless the Spirit. Amen. Okay, that's me too. Okay, Sam, let's, uh, let's get right to it. So the, uh, the Apostle Paul, in terms of Islamic apologetics, he's, he's the big bad guy. He's the guy who screwed up the faith that that Jesus preached, you know, from, from cradle, quite literally to grave or from cradle to assumed in heaven. And so he is the guy who screwed everything up uh, according to modern Islamic apologetics. Yes. Um, w why St. Paul? What, how come not someone else? They have to find a scapegoat because the Quran, and I'll mention the references and the listeners can either go back and read them. <clears throat> In chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 52, and chapter 5, verse 111. If you go to, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 52, and if you go to chapter 5, verse 111, there you'll be told that the followers of Jesus, the Hawariyun, that's the term used, and it's not even an Arabic term, according to some, and maybe even a loan word from the Egyptian language, the Coptic language, be that as it may. There we are told that the disciples of Jesus claim to be Muslims, the Arabic term is Muslimun. It says Muslimun. Now, depending on the translation, I don't know what you have. I've got Abdul Halim. Can you see if he translates the term as Muslims? Because that's what the Arabic says. It, I mean, in uh, 352, mm -hmm. when Jesus became aware that they still did not believe, he said, who will help me in God's cause? The disciple said, we will be God's helpers. We believe in God. we we'll witness our devotion to him. That's all it says? Uh, 352. So it says, witness our devotion to him. Wow, what a wow, what a contextualized, watered-down translation of the text. Now, guys, you don't need to know Arabic. You have excellent resources online, free of charge, where they provide the Arabic in transliteration, so you can read it in transliteration. So what is a transliteration? You take the words of one language and spell it out with the letters in another language. So you're going to have the Arabic terms spelled with English letters. Now, let me show you. I checked. It's in Sahih International. They actually say Muslim. So can you read that version? Sure. Um, but when Jesus felt disbelief from them, he said, who will be my supporters for the cause of Allah? The disciples said, we are supporters of Allah. We have believed in Allah and testified that we are Muslims. And then in brackets, it says submitting to him. So, yeah. So notice it's Muslimun in the Arabic, right? So Plural. bear with me, Jesus, that we are Muslims. And Muslim, the term Muslim means submit or surrender, to surrender. Theologically means to submit and surrender to the one God, Allah in Arabic. So notice Jesus' followers are Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. And then 5, 1, 11, it says the same thing. In chapter 5, verse 111, Yusuf Ali even captures it. I have in front of me. Chapter 5, verse 111, as the Lord Jesus enables us to recall these facts correctly for his glory. And behold, I inspired the disciples to have faith in me and mine apostle, meaning Jesus. 
They said, we have faith, and do thou bear witness. You, Jesus, bear witness to Allah. When we stand before Allah, this is the context. What do you mean bear witness? That means when we stand before Allah, you will bear witness, right, that we bow down to God, Allah, as Muslims, Muslimun. Yeah, it so says now, Muslim in here. Good. So Sai International is also not the best translation, yeah. but at least here it got it right. It told you that Jesus' followers are Muslims. Now, here's the dilemma for a Muslim. If Jesus' followers are Muslims, that means they believe what Muhammad taught in the Quran. So that means historically, whatever they taught must comport with Muhammad's teachings. Yet, the New Testament, which, again, even someone like Bart Ehrman would argue, though he doesn't believe Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark, and so on, and he believes it contains some forgeries, he would say, for the most part, the 27 books, with maybe a few exceptions, are first century documents. In other words, he would admit that when you want to look at first century Christians, what Jesus' followers taught, you go to the books of the New Testament, because they are pretty much first century documents. So a Muslim looks at the New Testament and sees, wait, hold on. The disciples sound anything but Islamic in their theology. So that means a corruption must have taken place because there's no way possible, no way possible, that Jesus' followers, Jesus' followers, could have taught a theology contrary to Muhammad. So then, half of the New Testament is written by this man named Paul. Even the documents in the New Testament teach Paul was not an earthly disciple of Jesus. He did not accompany Jesus when Jesus was on earth. You know what? He must be the culprit. He must have been the one who corrupted the message and influenced Christians so that the New Testament is a collection of what they call Pauline, Pauline theology. And that's where the corruption took place. Because it can't be Peter if Peter knew Jesus and walked with Jesus. It can't be John if John knew Jesus walked with So it's got to be Paul because even the New Testament admits he did not walk with Jesus when Jesus was on earth. And, and and in addition to the 11 disciples who, who, who were alive after after the ascension of, of Christ, um, keep in mind there's also John the Baptist, although he was no longer alive then, but there's also the Blessed Virgin, and the, the Quran speaks very highly of her, so they can't blame it on her either. No, they can't do that, because Mary in the Quran is considered the greatest woman that Allah created. That's in chapter 3, verse 42. For reference, if people don't believe that, Chapter 3 of the Chronicles 42. In fact, if you want to read it, Alan, you'll see it. It's right there. Chapter 3, verse 42. Yeah, we can do that. And she's, she's also got a whole chapter uh, devoted yeah. to her. Surat al Maryam, chapter 19, the chapter of Mary. The only woman mentioned by name. Women are not mentioned by name in the Quran. And her Arabic name, the Arabic form of her name is Maryam, which would correspond to the Hebrew Miriam. But, Maryam. Yeah. But aren't a lot Alusa and Manat mentioned in the Quran? Yep, chapter 53, verses 19 to 20. But remember, they're not they're not women, human, you females. Oh. They are goddesses, right? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, women okay. are not different names. These are goddesses. But if you look at 342 of the Quran, what does it say about the Blessed and w- Mother? Of all? And when the angel said, O oh, Mary, indeed Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the woman of the worlds. See? You've been chosen above all women. That's why in Islam, she is considered to be the greatest woman. And one of the titles given to her in Islamic theology is Al-Batul, the virgin. Because remember, at that time, the church, even the churches that were in schism, held this in common. She was a perpetual virgin. Mm-hmm. You yeah. have Protestants in the 7th century. So Muhammad is hearing what the Christians all believe. I don't care what branch of Christianity at that time. They all agreed on this, the perpetual virginity of Mary. Mm-hmm. And so he took that and adopted it. Yes, she's a perpetual virgin. So Islam, she is a virgin. She's called Al-Batul, meaning she was a virgin when she conceived, a virgin when she gave birth, remained a virgin, and now is taken to heaven. So they acknowledge that as well. Yeah, and it says, just a sign note, it says, and, and purified you. Like, uh, the, the, this is a debate, like, the Catholics believe she was purified at conception. The Greek church typically says uh, at the Annunciation, the Syriac church in the womb, so, like, post-conception, but still early on. So, like, th- they all agree that she was purified, that the question was when. The Quran, it does not say when, but it says she was indeed purified. And if you actually go to the commentators, they go, she was purified from conception, birth, and onwards. No. Oh. Yes, they do. The commentators agree that the purification wasn't after she came out of, of her mother's womb, 
but the purification was a cleansing that took place even in the con conception because she remained, they say, free of all impurities, all lust, all of it. She was free. Wow. She was a saintly woman. Well, chapter, chapter 75 says, a righteous a sadiha. Yeah, cause, because Pope, uh, I, I'm currently reading the, 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 the letters and homilies of Pope Leo the Great, who lived about a century and a half prior to Muhammad. And, and, and he was a very influential voice, voice, and he talks about her pure conception. Is pure immaculate conception? Probably. We, we can't be 100% sure, but like that's, that's obviously an opi uh, uh, a venerated opinion that was floating around at the time, right? And it's influencing Muhammad. And in 575, she's, a, she's even said to be a righteous woman, a saintly woman, a sadiqa. The, the Messiah, this verse 75, the Messiah, son of Mary, was not but a messenger messengers have packs on before him and his mother was a supporter of truth they both used to eat food look how he made clear to them the signs then look how they are deluded You're, these muslim translations kill me so in, in the sahih international it says she was she supporter of truth uh yeah i've got a couple other translations there if you want yeah i'm sorry to do this so this is another problem we have and the audience needs to know this be very careful of Muslim translations of the Quran. Many of them are very dishonest and deceptive because they sugarcoat what the Arabic says. And so here you have a Muslim translation as a support of truth. No, I'll give you one by Pikthal. Pikthal says, and his mother was a saintly woman. His mother was a saintly woman. Now Yusuf Ali says a woman of truth. Right? But St. Luke, because the word is Sadiqa. Because don't forget, this word is also, in the masculine form, is applied to one of Muhammad's companions. Muhammad's companion, Abu Bakr, is called uh, Abu Bakr al Sadiq. And ironically, James was called James the Just. Right? A Sadiq in, in Hebrew, right? Yeah. Sadiq. So again, it's, it's, she's a saintly woman, an honorable woman, a righteous woman. That's the implication of the term. In uh, the, the translation uh, by N.J. Dawood, this is the first Quran I ever owned, published by Penguin. I had this back in u university. It says saintly woman. Yeah, that's what it means. She's an honorable woman, a woman of integrity, a righteous woman, a just woman, a truthful woman. So, yeah, the Quran is aping what Christians believe at that time because, again, let's let's help the people realize why. If Muhammad came out and said, Jesus is a false messiah, his mother conceived him illegitimately, God forbid said blasphemy, no Christian would give him the time of day. Mm -hmm. So, he understands, he can't simply deny everything Christians believe because then the Christians will say, you know what, go to hell. You deserve to go to hell and may God damn you for blaspheming our Lord and insulting his blessed mother. So Muhammad realizes he's got to, and I believe he's under demonic influence to do so, that he's influenced by the devil or some evil spirit to do so. It's just like cults today. You have cults today, Joe's Witnesses, Mormons, you name it. They're going to affirm enough Christian truth to disarm Christians, to get them to consider the claims being made. And then that's when you find out all the contradictions with historic Christian faith. But they're going to speak in those areas that you agree and say, yeah, we believe that, yeah. I mean, here, one this modalist that I've been dealing with recently. They'll tell you Jesus is God. We believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, what do you mean Jesus is God? What do you mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Oh, we don't believe there are three eternal persons, but that the Father became flesh, and that human flesh is Jesus. So it's simply the Father in a different mode, right? And the Holy Spirit is the Father in spiritual activity. So they'll use the same vocabulary, but define it differently. But they're going to focus on commonalities to reel you in. And then that's where you see the problem. And that's what I'm on. Okay. And uh, before we go on, I'm going to read this one more translation. Uh, and his mother was an upright, one wholly devoted to God. And this is uh, uh, by Ali Yunal. I think he's Turkish. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Saintly, devoted, righteous, just woman. Exactly. So the Quran acknowledges that. And like I said, she's perpetual virgin. Now here's what's ironic. Now I haven't gotten too much into this, but 
I don't know if by the seventh century, I think so. By the seventh century, it probably was a common belief, the assumption of Mary. I know there was a debate whether she died and assumed, was she, and then she was assumed, or she was assumed without death. But chapter twenty-three, verse fifty, of the Quran implies the assumption of Mary. There is an allusion to it there in chapter twenty-three, verse fifty. We made the son of Mary and his mother assigned to mankind, and gave them shelter on a peaceful hillside watered by a fresh. That's mistranslation. Not a peaceful hillside. Okay. And, we, and we've taken him to a height. They were taken to a high place, not a hill. All right, so 23 what? 50. Okay. And I have an article. And by the way, as you're turning there, I do want to encourage your listeners to go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. That's the blog I run, and I try to update with articles several articles a week if I can. And I have an article on 2350 where I demonstrate how the Muslim commentators were all over the place because they could not understand what this text is actually saying. But it was brought to my attention. I was listening to a testimony of an Indian convert to Catholicism. He was a Muslim, he converted. In his discussion, he said that the, the Quran mentions the Assumption of Mary, and he said mistakenly, chapter 53, verse 20, I knew he meant chapter 23, verse 50. And then that got me interested, and I examined it, and he's right. Because the language doesn't say on a hill. It says that Mary and her son were taken to a height, a high place. Okay, it says, uh, for w we provided for them refuge on a lofty ground of comfort and security. Yeah, now, again, they're trying. Here, I'll give you a pick, though. And we made the son of Mary and his mother a port and a sign, and we gave them refuge on a height, a place of flocks and water springs. Now, if you compare the language of the Quran, and I go through this in my article, Jannah, Jannah meaning paradise, is a place in which you'll have water, you know, rivers of water, and so on and so forth. So I actually show how these terms are used elsewhere in the Quran for Jannah, paradise. And that's what it means. In fact, here, let me just give you another Rendering, <clears throat> Arbery, A.G. Arbery. And we made Mary's son and his mother to be a son and gave them refuge upon a height where was a hollow and a spring. A hollow and a spring. You catch it there? Okay, uh, but 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 can't you say they just, maybe that just means they went to heaven when they died? But that's my point. They went to heaven, right? Like their souls went to heaven? Well, no, and the Quran doesn't say Jesus died. Yeah, that's true. So, him to himself. And the mutawat, uh, meaning multiply attested, multiply attested narrations. When something in Sunni Islam, and I'm just educating the the Christians here, when you're dealing with Sunni Muslims, now this the Shia follow their own traditions, so they don't have the same traditions, but the mm -hmm. majority of Muslims are Sunni. The Sunni Muslims will tell you, the informed Sunni Muslims, the educated Sunni Muslims, because not every Sunni Muslim is educated. When you have something called mutawatir hadith, mutawatir means multiply attested narration, where several companions of Muhammad transmitted a saying, and that was transmitted through various lines. So let's say I'm a companion of Muhammad, I narrated the saying, and five people heard it from me, and they passed it on, and so on and so forth. So this is multiple attestation. More than one companion, several companions said, Muhammad said something, and they passed it on to a group, and they passed it on a group. Now it's considered mutawatir. When it's multiply attested, it is deemed equal in authority to the Quran. It has the same authority as the Quran. It is indisputable. There are multiply attested narrations, what's called mutawatir, that Jesus was taken physically, bodily to Allah and will return physically and bodily. What about Mary? That's the thing. Now, here's the question. Oh, because it's used in the same way, so it's naturally assumed they went to heaven the same way. You got now. You've got the question. And secondly, secondly, to add in the further thing, you said, "What about Mary?" It says Mary and her son were taken to a height. Yeah, yeah, that's what true. They so they had the same fate essentially. Okay. Now, added to that, in Islamic theology, when you die, if you're a Muslim, you don't go to Jannah. You don't go to paradise. That's not Islamic teaching. And I don't want anyone to take my word for it. Ask an informed Muslim. Say. Is it not true that when a person dies, his soul does not go to heaven or hell? It remains in the grave. So Muhammad's soul is in the grave. 
and the souls of others are in their graves. And once you're in your grave, you're shown your place in heaven or in hell. And if you are an unbeliever, you are tortured by dragons that bite you in the grave until the resurrection. And then you go to hell, right? Yes. Yeah, because it talks in the uh, the, uh, the Quran how, uh, how the Mushrikun, they, they go to hell, then, then, then Allah burns off all their skin, then he gives them new skin, and then he burns it off and he keeps giving them new skin, right? Yes, exactly. But when is that? After the resurrection. So now, what is Mary doing on a height if it's referring to her death? Because when she dies, she'll be in her grave, according to Islamic theology. Oh, so she's up in heaven already then, and so is Jesus. So where do you get that from? He's getting it from Christians. So here you have 7th century attestation, if you believe the Quran is 7th century, that the Christians believe this and Muhammad is aping it. Okay, so essentially the Virgin Mary, since she's praised to no end, can't be blamed for the corruption uh, of of the Christian faith, which, the Christian faith, the original supposed Christian Islamic Christian faith. So who's the culprit then? As you said, it essentially goes to St. Paul. Um, and I've, uh, I've actually got a question for you. Was, uh, was, who, who was the first I Islamic theologian to start this attack on St. Paul? That's a very good question. It's hard to pinpoint at which point of history because you'll have narrations that are 700 years after the time of Muhammad at a time in which you would have Muslims attacking Paul but acknowledging Paul. So to nail it to one person, that would be very hard to pinpoint any specific person because as we're going to show, I'm going to be quoting narrations that come 200 years after Muhammad's death, 300, 400, 500, 600. But I would say... Over 300 years after Muhammad's death, you will find sources that would speak critically of Paul, but you can't pinpoint any one specific individual. Yeah, because um, I think it's been a while since I've read this book, but I think this has an attack on Paul. Yes, yes. And even though at the time of this so-called debate this Muslim had, because I have the book with the, with the Christians, you would still find narrations being passed on by other Muslims that speak positively of Paul. It's like, I'll give you an example. Ibn Qayyim al jawziya who was the premier student, the premier student of what they call, the Salafis called Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. He writes during his time. And, and this is about the 13th century. This would be, actually, when you say 13th century, this is about 700 years after the death of Muhammad. So yes, in the 1300s, yes, 14th okay. century. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because, yeah, because they go by an Islamic calendar, the Hijrah, yeah. which that starts off when Muhammad migrated to Medina. Yeah. So now remember, this is about 700 years later. Now you have Ibn Qayyim, and I have this article on the blog. Just put in Ibn Qayyim, I-B-N-Q-A-Y-Y-I-M. Put Ibn Qayyim, Q-A-Y-Y-I-M, and put Torah. And then you'll see what he says was true in his day. And I'm, again, asking the Lord Jesus to help me to recall these facts correctly because we don't want to misinform. If I make a mistake, that's not intentional. I don't want to mis misrepresent any religion because we serve a God of truth who calls us to speak truth at all costs. Now, that said, he says in his time there were three views among the scholars in regards to the state of the Torah. He said one, one group said it's corrupted. We don't have the original. Another group says it's incorruptible, cannot be corrupted, because you can't change the words of Allah. A third group says there are minor corruptions that are insignificant, but we have the Torah substantially preserved. So what's my point? Even in that time, you'll have Muslims speaking positively and negatively. Muslims saying the Bible's preserved, Muslims saying no, it's not. So, so that's the thing. That's that's the thing, and same thing with Paul. You'll find the same thing with Paul. Okay, so like now in in twenty twenty, amongst the Islamic scholars, it, uh, it's pretty much universal. Probably ninety nine percent will say the Torah is corrupted. Ninety ninety nine percent will say that Paul at least played a role in screwing up the early church. Yes. yes. Uh, unfortunately, what they do is they they piggyback off of the rise of liberal critical scholarship that posited two forms or types of Christianity. 
Jewish Christianity and Pauline or Pauline Christianity. The Christianity represented by James, the brother of Christ, right? And the Christianity promoted by Paul. And you, 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 you're aware of these arguments. Yeah, oh yeah. Pretty much now obsolete and outdated because now the evidence shows there was no such thing as a Jewish Christianity in opposition to Pauline Christianity because Paul was in fellowship with James, who supposedly represents Jewish Christianity. And we don't have any evidence to the contrary. And so this assertion of a Jewish Christianity in opposition to Pauline Christianity. And then you still have some fringe group of scholars, like even Hans Kuhn, right? And I'm sure you've heard of Hans Kuhn. He's got a massive poem on Islam. I haven't read it all the way through. But he actually would argue that the Christology of the Quran comports with the Jewish Christian group. That the Jewish Christian group represented by James and his followers, like what you have in the Ebionites, that actually is closer to the Quran of Christology. But yeah, that's where it comes from. That Yeah, Paul was in opposition to the Jewish segment of Jesus' followers, and they represented the true form of Christianity, and Paul was in opposition to them, and he hijacked Christianity. But all of which is going to backfire against the Quran and prove that Allah is powerless or a deceiver, as we're about to demonstrate. Well, th th this is actually a good segue to the the portion I wanted to get into. I talked with you about this a couple of weeks back, that th they try to pick any part of the New Testament. We're talking about Muslim apologists here. They try to pick any part of the New Testament where there is friction uh, between... Um, Paul and the original disciples. But w when you take a look, the friction has nothing to do with uh, the death and resurrection v versus assumption, with Tawheed, with an Injil, with uh, 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 J James does not rebuke Paul for not talking about the direct prophecies of the prophet to come named Ahmed, w w which come from the Quran, by the way. And... Uh, like it's not on things Christians and Muslims would debate. It's on one minor point that plays no role in Christian Muslim debates. Talk about that for a bit. Hundred percent. The evidence you can't play fast and loose with the sources, and you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you ask the Muslims, how do you know there was a friction between Paul and quote unquote the Jewish Christians? Oh, because Paul mentions it or Luke mentions it. But hold on. If you're going to go to those sources, the friction had nothing to do with Christology, the person of Christ. They all agree Jesus is divine son who became flesh, who died for our sins, raised. He's now immortal. <clears throat> he is glorified in heaven, sits enthroned with the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords. In fact, you can easily prove this by going to the letter attributed to James. And historically, we have no reason for rejecting that James wrote it. James, the Lord's brother. And again, I know the term brother, when I say brother... I know their traditions say relative. So still, even when you say brother, however you want to explain it. But the point is, if you go to James, if you go to chapter 1, verse 1, James begins his epistle. How does he begin the epistle in James chapter 1, verse 1? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Right there, that's blasphemy from a Muslim perspective. Because he's talking about the ascendant Christ. Christ is not on earth. He's in heaven. Mm -hmm. And yet he says, I am the servant the slave, the bond slave of God and Jesus Christ. Islamic theology, that is a violation of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. Because you cannot have a Lord other than Allah in heaven. And you cannot serve or slave for someone other than Allah, especially someone in heaven. Yet Jesus, James says, I am the slave of God and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Acknowledging that Jesus in heaven is the Lord of believers and that he's the slave of Jesus just as much as he's a slave of God. Problem with Islam. Because Islam says that violates Tawheed. And Jesus could not be reigning as Lord and could not have slaves on earth if he wasn't one with the Father. So that's one argument, right? So so talk to us about a, a bit about Acts chapter 21, verses 17, when yes. Paul arrives. That that's, I mean, if this was any place to rebuke uh, Paul for, for uh, condemning Tawheed, condemning the future prophecies supposedly of Muhammad, uh, preaching the death and resurrection over escape from death and assumption. This would be it. But, but what do they talk about, Sam? 
if you go to Acts 21, and here Christians will have maybe a difference of opinion of how to interpret the implication of the passage. I'm going to give you my understanding in Acts 21. When Paul arrives, he's met with James, who is now the leader of the Jerusalem church and the elders. Luke is accompanying him because Luke mentions himself as part of the company, right? Yep. As a narrative. Now I say Luke because we have no reason to reject that Luke wrote it. Yes, um, I agree. Want to be a German. There is no good reasons to say Luke didn't write Luke, but be that as it may. The author is there, and he's part of this <clears throat> experience. He's encountered, he's there. James and the elders tell Paul, and this is where we have to read carefully. A lot of people don't read it carefully. He says, you see how many Jews have believed, have believed. Myriads of Jews have believed, meaning in Jesus as the Messiah, and are zealous for the law, zealous for the law. Then they say, but they have heard Paul. And this is where people don't read carefully. They have heard Paul. They have heard, and he's talking to Paul, they have heard about you, Paul. They have heard, comma, Paul, that you teach the Jews living among the Greeks, in other words, the Hellenized Jews, the Grecian Jews, to ignore our customs, not to circumcise, and pretty much walk contrary to the law of Moses. That's what they said. That's what they've heard about you. you who, who are you teaching this to? Jews. Which Jews? Those scattered, the diaspora Jews, the dispersion. Now, what are we going to do to show there's no truth to that claim? Here's what you do. We got, we got four men who have taken a vow. It's a Nazarite vow, by the way. Now, again, to show that you are not teaching the Jews to disregard the law of Moses and not circumcise their children, but that you are obedient to the law, like we are, ethnic Jews, go and announce to the priest the fulfillment of the vow and pay for the fulfillment of the vow. And that's what Paul actually does. So what's the debate here? Are they having a problem with Paul telling Gentiles, those who are not ethnically Jews, that you don't need to keep those aspects, those customs of the law that define what makes a Jew a Jew in distinction from a Gentile? No, he's not telling Gentiles, I'm sorry, he's not, he's not going around telling the Gentiles, you know, that you shouldn't keep the law in this regard because the Jewish Christians say you Gentiles have to keep it. They're, they don't have a problem with Paul telling Gentiles, in other words, you don't need to get circumcised. You don't need to keep kashrut, the dietary prohibitions of the law of Moses. They don't have a problem with him teaching that to the Gentiles. What they're saying is, the accusation is that you're teaching Jews not to do it. But we know, Paul, that you know. And here's my challenge for everyone. I want you to pick up any letter of Paul. See where Paul is speaking to ethnic Jews and telling ethnic Jews, you don't need to keep these aspects of the law. And what the context is when he tells Gentiles you don't have to keep it. You don't need to keep the law of Moses for salvation. You don't need to live like a Jew and act like a Jew and eat like a Jew and get circumcised as a Jew to be saved. He's talking to Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a problem with Paul when it comes to the Gentiles. Read it carefully. They're saying, but the rumor is you're telling the Jews to don't get circumcised and don't keep Sabbath and don't keep those aspects of the law that we have kept all these centuries in honor of the God of Moses. So again, let me clarify so I don't confuse people. They're not telling Paul that you keep the law for salvation. That issue does not come up. Because even in Acts 21, they allude to the decisions of the Jerusalem Council. Yep. If you read Acts 21-25, they go as far as the Gentiles are concerned. Read what they say in Acts 21-25. But as far as the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from so, unchastity. And, from, and, and observe chastity, refrain from sexual morality. Yeah. So notice the discussion is not how Gentiles should live. Paul, what are, the rumor is you're telling Jews to discard the law of Moses. And it's not obeying the law for salvation because notice they're alluding to the Jerusalem Council. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Acts 15, verses 7 to 11. Because I need to clarify that because you asked me a question that needs some time to unpack lest the, the audience gets confused. I don't want to misunderstand, as the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue, what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. So let's go to Acts 15, verses 7 to 11. The context here, before you read it, just so we can give them the context, there were Jews, specifically the party of the Pharisees, who had converted and became followers of Jesus. 
They're going around telling the Gentiles, Paul is wrong, you need to keep the law like we Jews, get circumcised like we Jews, and Paul and Barnabas are in sharp dispute with these Jews. No, they don't. So they take their, their, they take their dispute to Jerusalem, where the apostles are. Peter is there, and James is there. So they go, this is the issue. Paul, Barnabas, we're teaching the Gentiles, you don't need to get circumcised, observe Sabbath or Keshru, dietary restrictions to be saved. Trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. These Jews are arguing with us, saying, no, that's not enough. Trust in Jesus, get circumcised, keep all these aspects of the law we keep. Who's right? Now notice what Peter says, Acts 15, 7 to 11. What does Peter say? All right, and after there had been much debate, Peter rose and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice among you that by my mouth and the Gentiles... By my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you make trial of God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we, nor we have been able to bear, but we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. So Peter says it. Paul and Barnabas are right. Our fathers tried to be justified by keeping the law, and where did that land them? In trouble. They got condemned. Mm -hmm. Neither our fathers nor us can be justified by keeping the law of Moses. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ through faith, and when we trust in him, we Jews and Gentiles are purified. So it's not an issue of salvation. It's an issue of, okay, now that I'm saved, obviously I'm saved by the grace of God not to live lawlessly, but to live in obedience to Jesus. Because I'm his slave, I'm his property, I belong to him, and I live the way he wants me to live. So now, as Jews, we still keep those aspects of the law that Gentiles don't need to. So as a Jew, I get circumcised on eighth day. As a Jew, I keep dietary provisions. You Gentiles, you don't need to do that. But neither the Jews nor you need to do the law for salvation. See, this is the issue. So now here's the debate. Acts 21, are they telling Paul, you're teaching a false Jesus. Jesus is not the Son of God. You need to repent. No. You're teaching the Trinity. You need to repent. No. You're teaching a different gospel. No. What is the debate? They heard that you're telling the Jews who are saved by the grace of Jesus, We've already settled that. Peter said it. They're saved by the grace of Jesus. But now you're telling them, now that they're saved by grace, these Jews don't have to get circumcised and keep Sabbath. Paul, we know that's not what you teach because you are in agreement with us. We ethnic Jews, we still keep those aspects of the law as our way of showing our submission to Jesus and our love for Jesus that our faith is not lip service or a dead faith. That's the dispute. Now, however you want to interpret it, because some may say, well, no, I don't think that Paul or the ethnic Jews still kept those aspects of the law. You need to read it. You need to wrestle with it. You need to struggle with it. See how you're going to reconcile what the passage says. But however you reconcile it, they don't have an issue with Paul when it comes to Christology. Who is Jesus? They don't have an issue with Paul when it comes to the Godhead. Is there only one person or three persons? They don't have an issue with Paul. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins to save us. And that God raised them. They all agree. They're in perfect agreement. So whatever the dispute is, it does not lend itself to Islam. Nor does it confirm what the Muslims are saying. Paul hijacked the gospel and preached a different gospel. Because the Jews were in line with Paul's Christology and gospel. Okay, yeah. And, and I, I think that also shows something else. That Luke... Uh, or, or, or if you want to be more neutral, the author of Acts. Um, I mean, if the author of Acts is w willing to show where there's friction between Paul and th his original disciples, the original disciples of Christ, it, that that's not something he would hide. So it, it, if there was a huge rift, like, uh, like uh, oh, no, he's not... Uh, he's telling, not telling them about the Injil or the future prophet named Ahmed. Uh, Luke would have pointed that out, but instead he doesn't. Uh, 
talk about that. There's something I've always wanted to ask the Muslim apologist. Perhaps you've asked him this. Did the people like Paul and the author of the Gospels know about all these Quranic statements and beliefs of of the Islamic Jesus, but wrote their Gospels to try to cover them up? Like, did Paul know? Yeah, well, their argument would be that Jesus would have taught Islam, but what you have in the Gospels is the influence of Paul's theology, because they say the Gospels are written after Paul's letters. So you have Paul even influencing and shaping the Gospels to reflect the Jesus that is more in line with Pauline Christianity, Pauline Christianity, even though sometimes the true historical Jesus' teachings <clears throat> can be found. For example, Matthew 5, 17, do not think I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but fulfill. Ah, they say that's Jesus teaching be Torah observant. See, that slipped the cracks. Matthew wasn't able to, you know, just wash over that or, you know, to just simply ignore it. He, it slipped the cracks. So you see, that's historical Jesus. Torah observant Jesus. Uh, Torah observant Jew. And that's what he called his followers to do. So that's what they'll basically tell you, that the Gospels are written after the fact, and they're un written under the influence of Paul, but you still find those little cracks in the Gospels where the historical Jesus comes through, and the historical Jesus contradicts Paul's Gospel. For example, they'll also appeal to Jesus telling the rich man, hey, you want to obtain eternal life? Believe in me? No. They say, he says, you know the commandments. Contradicts Paul. Paul says, by keeping the commandments, no one will be justified. But the, Jesus in Matthew says, hey, you know the commandments. And that's also repeated in Mark and in Luke. Keep them and you'll have eternal life. So they think because they read selectively. They don't read in context. So in, in, in Surah 61, 6, where uh, Jesus supposedly predicted predicts Muhammad by name do Muslim apologists that like Paul and the gospel uh, think Paul and the gospel writers because the gospel writers are Pauline although some stuff may come through the cracks they're Pauline authors do Muslim apologists think they know about verses like this and got to make sure to to omit it now a sharp you see again you if you're talking about the sharp and the form of some they'll say well that's an Arabic term and Jesus didn't speak Arabic. So what does Ahmed mean? The praised worthy one or the praised one. So they'll say, we're not necessarily claiming that he used the word Ahmed because the Quran is narrating Jesus's words in Arabic, mm. right? Yeah. But Ahmed, they'll say, means the praised one. That's why if you read Pictal's translation, he translates the word. He doesn't transliterate it. Here, I'll give you Pictal. He translates the word. He doesn't transliterate it. Here, let, uh, let me show you. Because most of the Qurans, they transliterate it, right? Mm -hmm. Here it is. Um, and then Jesus it says, uh, I and bringing good tidings of a messenger who cometh after me, whose name is the praised one. Whose name is the praised one. So what did he do? He translated what it means. They'll go, and there are hints in the Gospels, though they've been corrupted and influenced by Pauline theology, that Jesus anticipated prophets or a prophet to come after him. Right? For example, they'll tell you, beware of false prophets. Now, their objection is this. Why would Jesus say, beware of false prophets, if he's not assuming true prophets will come after him? Because if there are no prophets, he'll just say, no prophet after me, anyone who claims to be such, he's a false prophet, ipso facto, end, end of the story. The very fact that he's giving you a criterion, that there will be false prophets, presuppose a true one will come. So how do you distinguish the true one from the false one? Here's the criterion. You see their argumentation, how they're arguing, how they're reasoning? Yeah, but that that's really slippery. <laughs> like that's really picking at straws, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but we have to be careful, though. We are we do believe, according to the New Testament documents, Book of Acts mentions prophets that were sent after Jesus. Agabus, you go to Acts eleven twenty seven twenty nine. Prophets were there in Antioch, Syria. One of them was Agabus, who prophesied by the Holy Spirit a famine would break out. Or in Acts fifteen thirty two, two prophets accompanied Paul and Barnabas. Acts fifteen thirty two. When they're going around taking the letter, the decisions of the Jerusalem Council to the Gentile churches, right? Or if you go to Acts 21, Agabus shows up again. In fact, if you read Acts 21, 9 all the way to 13, specifically 10, 11, it says, Philip, the evangelist, had virgin daughters 
four virgin daughters that prophesied, and Agabus, the prophet, again prophesied that the Holy Spirit says, this is what will happen to the owner of the belt. They'll bind him up and arrest him in Jerusalem. And Jesus himself says in Matthew 23, 34, in Matthew 23, 34, I will send you prophets. So yeah, there are prophets, but here's the problem for the Muslims. These prophets were sent by the risen Jesus, the exalted Christ in heaven. He sent them in the power of the Holy Spirit that he poured out. So they are prophets of the risen Christ. Now that introduces another problem for Muslims. Muslims, how can Jesus in heaven commission prophets on earth and how can he be, he be the one pouring out the Spirit from the Father to empower the prophets to prophesy if he's a creature and he's not God? So that actually backfires against you. There are prophets, but they're sent by the risen Jesus who's exalted in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he's the one who gives them the Spirit to prophesy, and they prophesy in his name, preaching his gospel, all of which Muhammad did not do. You end up with Jesus being God, the God of the prophets, and Muhammad a false prophet. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, no, the, uh, and of course it says that the, the, the faith of Christ, it says in the Quran that the faith of Christ, uh, he, that, that God would give his apostles victory till the day oh, yeah, oh, yeah. of, of resurrection. That objection shows why Paul can't be a false prophet. I don't know how we're doing on time, but that objection shows Paul cannot be a false prophet. If you want to, or false apostle, obviously, the, in the New yeah. Testament, apostle is higher than a prophet. Yeah. But when I say prophet, in a generic sense, he prophesied and proclaimed the gospel, but his specific office is he's an apostle. And according to 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 29, I don't want people to take my word for it. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 29, an apostle is higher in status than a prophet. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 29. First are apostles, second are prophets. So apostle, ironically, is greater than a prophet, not the other way around, as far as the New Testament is concerned. So Paul is more than a prophet. He's greater than a prophet. He's an apostle. Prophets are subject to the apostles who are subject to Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 29. So ironically, right? They'll tell you, Paul wasn't a prophet. Yeah, he was greater than a prophet. And the prophets of Christ were subject to him and the other apostles who were higher than them in authority. So with that said... And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in various kinds of tongues. So who's first? The apostles. So who's greater in rank and authority? The apostles are over the prophets. And the prophets are subject. So when they say, well, Paul isn't a prophet, say, yeah, he's greater than a prophet. He's an apostle. Hmm. I've never heard that. That's well, clever. It's there, right? right there yeah, yeah that, that's weird because i've read the verse before and obviously i just haven't put two and two together to uh yeah so essentially muslims if you're watching muslims i'm gonna it, in honor of uh see this is uh an icon of saint peter and saint paul say saint peter's got the keys there and saint paul is right next to him and uh so and basically, we're saying that if you're going to be consistent, you have to believe in them, them equally, the historical yeah. ones. And uh, now, I know there's some early right. uh, Islamic scholars of the the early Islamic period post Muhammad that that talk very highly about Paul. Yes, and why they do so? Let me just mention the two Quranic references. I'll read them, and you have Ibn Asqaq's work translated in front of you, right? I certainly do, by when you get, Fred Guillaume. When you get a chance, go to page 653, page 653 of the English translation. It's not the Arabic, it's the English translation. Now, I'll tell you when to read it. Now, for the Christians, you need to learn this argument. You really need to learn this argument. And Muslims, listen to the dilemma that your prophet puts you in. Chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran. And folks, I will send the links to these articles to Alan so you can make them available. I've written articles on these, so you can use this information in your witness for the glory of Christ. In chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, it says this. Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, supposedly Allah is speaking to Jesus when he's about to leave the earth. Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. Now watch this. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Here's what Allah promised Jesus. 
your followers who follow you, they will be superior, uppermost dominant, and their superiority, their dominance, dominance will start when I take you and remain till the day of resurrection. Last time I checked, the day of resurrection hasn't <clears throat> occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, Allah keep his promise, 61.14 of the Quran. Chapter 61.14 says, yes, he did. Because in 61.14 of the Quran, it says this, O you who believe, be helpers of Allah, as said Jesus, the son of Mary, to the disciples. Who will be my helpers to the work of Allah? Said the disciples, we are Allah's helpers. Then a portion of the children of Israel believe, and a portion disbelieve. But we gave power to those who believed against their enemies. And they, the believers, became the ones that prevailed. So Allah kept his promise. Jesus, I take you to myself. Your followers prevail. They overcome the unbelievers, and their dominance will be secured, and they'll remain uppermost till the day of resurrection. Now here's the dilemma before you read that. Since Paul wrote half of the New Testament, since Paul's writings have been preserved from the first century onwards and have spread like wildfire, and his message has dominated and preserved to this day, and it's become uppermost because it's quote-unquote Pauline Christianity, even though his gospel agrees with Peter, James, and John, for argument's sake, this so-called Christianity dominated the first century, century, spread like wildfire subsequent centuries so that till this day, the majority of Christians follow the New Testament writings, half of which were penned by Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If Paul is not a true follower of Christ, that means he hijacked the message of the true followers. He triumphed over them. His message prevailed over against theirs. Their message disappeared, and Paul's message spread so that either Paul falsified Allah's promise, so he's more powerful than Allah, or Allah lied, but the Quran says he didn't lie, or Paul must be a true apostle, one of those that Allah used and empowered to spread the message because Paul's message is Jesus's message, which is why it has become uppermost and dominant till this day. There's no way around this. And this was the same logic, Alan, that the early Muslims used because in page 653, you'll find a statement about Jesus's followers being sent by the power of Allah to spread Jesus's message successfully all over the world. Did you find it? I did. Those whom Jesus, son of Mary, sent, both disciples and those who came after them in the land were Peter, the disciple, and Paul with him. And it says in brackets, Paul belonged to the followers and was not a disciple, close bracket, to Rome. So Peter and Paul, just pause. So Peter and Paul went to Rome. This is what all the early sources say. And, and then it continues, Andrew and Matthew to the land of the cannibals, Thomas to the land of Babel, which is in the land of the east, Philip to Carthage, which is Africa, John, um, John to Ephesus, the city of the young men of the cave, James to Jerusalem, which is Alia, the city of the sanctuary. That's what the Romans called J Jerusalem, Alia. Uh, Bartholomew to Arabia, which is the land of the Hejaz. Simon to the land of the Berbers, which is like Morocco and Algeria. Judah, who was not one of the disciples, was put in the place of J Judas. Wow. So notice a narration. This biography was originally written around 750 AD. It was edited around 8th in the 9th century, about 100 years later, by Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham, when he edited, he left this citation intact, and other Muslim scholars like Tabari and Qurtubi cited it authoritatively. But notice, not only do you have Jesus' disciples' name, not only do you have Jesus' universal mission confirmed, destroying the lie of the Muslim apologist that Jesus is only sent to the Jews, because what you read, they were sent to the whole world, to Africans, to Italians, to Jews, but then you find something important. Peter and Paul went together to Rome and preached the message of Jesus Christ. Now, it says something quite true. It even gets James, the brother of the Lord, his location right. He was in Jerusalem. He even got that right. And well, you know, from the church fathers, Irenaeus mentions Peter and Paul did go to Rome, right? I mean, we have that. 
Oh, yeah, and there's a lot of evidence for it, not just St. Irenaeus. And and it's also right about John, saying that John was in Ephesus. See that? Yeah. So this source is coming from Christians, and they're quoting it approvingly, and no one is rejecting it. But here's another insight from the writer, Ibn Iskand. He says that Paul wasn't a disciple, he was a follower. Now let me explain what that means in Islamic terms. Jesus' followers would be called Sahaba, companions that knew him. The followers after them would be called Tabiun. So here again, they got it right. Paul did not follow Jesus. He wasn't his earthly disciple, but he was a disciple of the followers of Jesus, such as Peter. So it's not saying Paul did not see Jesus in a vision. It's saying that Paul was not with Jesus when Jesus was on earth. Absolutely correct. So now what do you have? What's the implication? These Muslims could see if the Quran is right and Paul has influenced Christianity and his writings have dominated and have spread like wildfire all over the world, then if the Quran is right, Paul must have been an instrument used by Allah to preserve Jesus's message and to spread it and make it uppermost. Otherwise, Paul has defeated Allah and Allah was powerless against Paul. You can't get around it. Well, and and he, there's actually something, I just want to read this, in the first sentence, or the first part here, that uh, it is good for the context and the d differentiation that is made between Paul and Peter. It says, those whom Jesus the Son of Mary sent, both disciples and those who came after them in the land were, and it talks about all of them because they were disciples, then it talks about Paul and he differentiates. He's one of the ones that came after, but still nevertheless sent by sent Jesus by Christ. You so Paul, so Paul sent still, by Jesus. 100% accurate. So Muslims, you have a dilemma. And there's another dilemma. This is on my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. I'll send you the links. I have an article, a, a precious brother, a brother in Christ who used to be a Muslim, translated these sources in English and made them available for me to put on my blog. The name of the article is The Apostle Paul and Early Islamic Exegesis. In it, I even quote Muslim scholars recounting Paul having a vision of the risen Jesus and Jesus commissioning them. Muslim scholars narrating that as a true historical event validating Paul. Now, here's what's interesting. There's a story in the Quran, chapter 36 of the Quran, verses 13 onward. There it says that two apostles were sent to a town, and a third apostle was sent to strengthen them. The Quran doesn't give us their names, but the Muslim tradition says, and uh, gives us the names. The Muslim tradition gives us the names, and the majority interpretation was the following. The majority of Muslim scholars say that the three apostles were, let me give you one of them. Here's a source. This comes from Tafsir al-Quran al-Adhim, or you can say al-Adhim, by Ibn Abi Hatim. And others, too, mention this. He says, from Shu'ayb al-Jaba'i, he said, the, the name of the messengers, apostles, who said, when we have sent them to, are Simon and John, there's Peter, there's John, and the name of the third is Paul. What verse in the Quran? Chapter 36 of the Quran, verses 13 onward, narrates a story where Allah sent two apostles to a town and thir sent a third apostle to then strengthen them. The Quran doesn't give the names. The Muslim commentators do. And it says, and this is all in the article, the majority interpretation, the majority of scholars say that the three apostles were Simon, John, and Paul. In Arabic, his name is Bulis. Now you see why I keep saying Bulis on my live streams. <laughs> yeah, that gets me laughing. I'm not gonna Okay, but did you catch it? Why yeah, so, are these Muslim scholars saying Paul was an apostle sent by Allah to strengthen the two other apostles, Simon and John, if Paul corrupted the message? This is the tradition. It's right here in that article, St. Paul in Early Islam. It's all available for free, translating the Muslim scholars in English because Christians, please, for the glory of the triune God, for the glory of Jesus, to see Muslims get saved, Get these links, you have my permission to upload them to your channels, print them out, use them, disseminate them, educate Christians and Muslims, 
The evidence is overwhelming. Muhammad is a false prophet. And Paul was truly an inspired spokesperson of the risen Lord Jesus. What's the earliest uh, condemnation of Paul that you can think of offhand in Muslim offhand, sources? Doesn't I don't recall any specific condemnation in the early centuries. But I would su suspect about 300 years later, perhaps around 1,000, the attack started. It may have been earlier, but like I said, as, off the top of my head, I can't recall anything negative by Paul. Now, even the, the writing you have, that Muslim apologist, he's having a dispute with Christians, but what is the date of his polemic, his, his debate? I, I can't remember offhand. It's been a while since I read this, but I think it's shortly after the year 1000, like 1020 or Around something like that. that. Time, 11th century. Just so yeah. people can see it. And I have that excellent work. So notice Ex it starts from, it becomes more widespread and prevalent around 1,000. I'm not saying there, there aren't earlier dissenters, right? But I'm saying it becomes more widespread around 1,000, 11th century, right? But yes, I am positive, and I'm Muslim saying you're lying. I want Muslims to hear me. I'm not saying you won't find earlier dissenters, voices earlier than dissenting, but then you have a problem. It confirms what I said. Even when you have a dissenting voice, then you have these other scholars that affirm Paul. That, does Al Qurtubi say anything about Paul? Al Qurtubi actually quotes this narration of 6114, and he cites he cites Ibn Ishaq. Let me show you. I'm going to get it to you. Al Qurtubi. In his commentary on 61 verse 14, 6114, where it says the believers in Jesus were made uppermost and they defeated the unbelievers. He quotes Ibn Ishaq to explain 6114. Here it is. It's in my article. Here's this exposition of 6114. It was said that this verse, what verse? 6114, was revealed about the apostles of Jesus. May peace and blessing be upon him. Ibn Ishaq stated the, the apostles and disciples that Jesus sent to preach, there were Peter and Paul who went to Rome. Did you catch that, Alan? Yeah, straight from page 653. He quotes... Ibn Ishaq's narration to explain what? The Quran. Which verse 6114? Because 6114 says, Those who believed in Jesus were made uppermost and they were victorious over the unbelievers. And he says, This is how it played out historically. Those who were victorious over the unbelievers were Peter and Paul, and he mentions the rest. Okay. All right. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to say about Paul? To me, he is the greatest Christian evangelist that ever lived. I know Peter was given primacy over the apostles. That's something spiritual, so I'm not... But I'm saying, in my view, Paul is my hero. And I pray in Jesus' name that if I find favor with the Lord, I can be like Paul in his love and his worship and devotion to the triumph God, especially to the Jesus that he persecuted. Here's someone who blasphemed Jesus and persecuted the church, who became one of the greatest defenders and proclaimers of the honor and the divine majesty and dignity of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I pray you make us all like Paul for your glory out of love for you, because we love you, Son of God. In Jesus' name, because Paul is my hero. Well, well, and modern Muslim apologists don't just say he was... Uh, not a true follower, that they say the nasty, they say some very nasty things about him. Yes, uh, and like, well, yeah, and the thing is, if you compare the life of Paul versus the life of Muhammad, I mean, it's not even close. Paul's one of the holiest people who ever lived. Yeah. And he honored dignified women. In fact, I would say this Paul is not worthy to kiss the sandals of Jesus or the ground that Jesus walked on. Yet, Muhammad is not worthy to lick the sandals of Paul. Yeah, that's true, and uh, <laughs> not worthy by a long shot. Like uh, what, one time, I was I, I was interacting with a Muslim on Paul Williams's website, and this guy's like he talks about how bad Christians behave, how bad their morals are, and then I I responded to him. Uh, I'm like, look, you know, I'll 
since he knew I was Catholic, it's like, let's take the life of any Catholic saint. Just, just pick him. I'll let you pick him and compare him to the life of Muhammad. And, uh, it's, it, 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 it's a century. You pick the saint, you know, pick any saint you want, you know, just, and compare them to that, the largest spiritual fraud in the history of, see the, the thing, a true believer, someone who truly understands the Bible, well, I, I, or who truly respects and tries their best to understand the Bible yeah. is going to take a look at someone like Muhammad and say he's no different than Baha Allah or, or Joseph Smith or Mirza Ghulam Ahmed or anyone like that, right? Some of them are actually even better than Muhammad with the exception of Joseph Smith. <laughs> yeah, because Baha Allah Bab, from what I recall, and don't quote me on this, I'm going by memory because I haven't studied their life in depth. They spent over 23 years in prison. Yeah. Okay. So they were actually better examples than Muhammad. Muhammad raped women. And I'm not attacking. This is the truth. He raped women. He even raped married women. That's chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran. That if they took a captive woman who was still married, they could rape her. Now, women, I want women to tell me, and Muslim women to be honest with me. Which woman taken captive, right, by an army? who've seen her family members uh, slaughtered, would want to voluntarily sleep with her captors. Yeah. That There's a woman there, then she is an immoral slime. She's worse than a dog. A woman with any dignity would not allow anyone to touch her. That came has now attacked your land, your village, your city, and murdered your loved ones, especially if the woman's husband is still alive. But the Quran says, hey, you Muslim men, you take women captive, sleep with them, and sell them off, even if they're married. That's your right from Allah. That's chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran. Read it, and read the exposition. Like Sunan Abu Dawud, number 2150. Sunan Abu Dawud, number 2150 in the English. 424, chapter 4, verse 24. And as you turn there, what do you do with Muhammad prostituting women, treating women as whores, whoring women under the guise of temporary marriage? Zawad Jilmuta. Temporary marriage which is also based on 424 and 587 and found in the Hadith. But in 424, what does it say? It says, and uh, and also, it, it says, and in brackets, also prohibited to you are all, close bracket, m married women except those your right hand possesses. Except, wait, wait, except what? Those your right hand possesses. So not all forms of adultery are forbidden. There's an adultery that Allah permits. What adultery? If you capture a married woman, sleep with her, rape her, violate her, and sell her off because she's your property. And it says, this is in Sahih International, there's a footnote. If you go to the footnote, it says, i.e., slaves or war captives who had polytheist husbands. So, yeah, that's exactly what you're saying. Well, you cut, right? And this is Sahih International. It's not sugarcoating it. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's from Saudi Arabia. So you caught it, right? Yeah. Now, you're telling me this man was a moral example? Example of moral virtue. <laughs> I've never told you that. Oh, no, you know, just generally, right? Yeah. He was a sick, demented, demonized, narcissistic, whoremonger, who who whored women, prostituted them, and raped them in the name of his God. Who took a minor and slept with her and left her a widow at the age of eighteen, so she could never marry again. And she lived for many years after that without a husband, without children, right? And sanctioned marriages to premature, prepubescent minors, chapter 65, verse 4 of the Quran, who lusted for the wife of his adopted son, causing a divorce because Allah had ordained for him to have adulterous, lustful desires for a married woman, his adopted son's wife. And then when the divorce took place, they say, well, I did that so that I can show you by example that you men, you too can marry the divorced wives of your adopted sons. But then when they mocked him and humiliated him, Ah, look at you. You claim to be a prophet. You stole your son's wife. Abolish adoption saying, no, he's not my son. Stop calling your adopted sons your sons because they're not true sons. Call them the sons of their fathers. Because of his wicked, adulterous, immoral lust, he even abolished adoption to save face. He, all in the name of his God. He uh, abolished adoption just so he could sleep with this one woman. And there's something I often uh, bring up to Muslims. I know in England, like Speaker's Corner, a lot of da'wah goes on in England. I, uh, I'd like to say, because of England, they all know, Muhammad had worse sexual morals than King Henry VIII. I mean, <laughs> can anyone dispute? Now, King Henry VIII, he executed two of his ex-wives, but 
I, I don't think that's sexual morals. That's personal morals. But but in terms of just grabbing anyone you can, you know, Muhammad put Henry the Eighth to shame, you know. And compared to Paul, who taught in First Corinthians seven verses one to five, he wished everyone had the gift to be celibate like him, to devote themselves entirely to ministry. But he goes, if you burn, this is Paul, First Corinthians seven verses one to five. Saints, read that. He says, if you burn, let each man have his own wife not wives, and each woman her own husband, not husband, mon monogamy confirmed. And then he says something beautiful, beautiful to show God's love for both the woman and the man. In fact, if you want to read it, read it. First Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. This is why I say he's my hero, because Jesus is my God. He's God Almighty. He's more than a hero. He's my Savior God. And of all the people he rose up, raised up for his glory, Paul's my hero. First Corinthians 7, verses 1 to 5. Watch this now. Watch this. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. But because of the temptation to immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Does the, he say wives? Uh, no, he doesn't. So just like a woman can only have one husband, a man can only have wife. And notice, he didn't say each man should have a girlfriend and shack up with her. No, marriage. Yeah. Uh, and no well, But read the next part before you stop. Read the next because I want you to see how good it gets. Keep reading. For the wife does not rule over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not rule over his own body, but the wife does. Do not refuse one another except perhaps by agreement for a season that you may... Pause right there. Uh, did you catch it? Husband, your wife owns your body. Wife, your husband owns your body. Do you get any more fair than that? Uh, yeah, no, like that's, that's as equal as you can get. It, it, it's not like the Quran that says their testimony is, is half, right? You know, well, even worse, the Quran, if you go to chapter two of the Quran and you read, go to chapter two of the Quran, read verses 223, chapter two, verse 223, read what it says there. It's worse. Chapter two, verse 223. Your wives are a place of cultivation. It says in brackets, sowing the seed, close bracket for you. So come wait, wait. to your wives are what to them? A place of cultivation. They're till their field. Your wife is like property, your field. You can plow into her the way you want. <laughs> Did you catch that? Al? Yeah, that's pretty I give you the historical context of the guy. I want Muslims and Christians to hear that. Chapter two, verse two twenty three says <laughs> You men, your wives are your fields, your tilth, your tillage. Plow into them the way you want. Notice what Paul said. Husbands, your bodies are not yours. They belong to your wives. They have rights over your bodies. Don't deny them and vice versa. But if I give you the historical context of this passage, don't take my word for it. Go read that, these. A man used to sleep with his wife in a certain position and she didn't like it. I don't want to get too graphic. And she said no. So you know what Muhammad said? You have no right to say no. He owns you. You're his field. He can plow into you the way he wants. Don't say no to him. That was the context of that passage. There you go, Alan. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And, like, I, I know David Wood has made uh, v videos of that, and he quotes commentators like Jalalain and, and others. Okay. And there was even a dispute. I don't want to get too graphic. There are some Muslims who said that this passage allows, what's the proper way of saying? Anal intercourse, I'm sorry. And some said, no, it forbids it. Yeah. Okay. It gets. And uh, like, for example, I know you can uh, ch check the Hebrew on this, but they, they try to say, where did Jesus, this is something that the Muslims always say, oh, where did Jesus prohibit polygamy? Because although polygamy was permitted in the old testament yes. if, if you look carefully it's always frowned upon and bad stuff always happens exactly. when polygamy is involved like take a look at solomon take a look and at abraham first, take a look at the way, the first polygamist was lemek the son of cain and he murdered a man right yeah exactly i, I mean okay uh, i'll i'll say this uh, he answered, okay, for this reason, this is Matthew 19, verse 5, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, if you take a look in the, uh, the Torah, uh, in 2.24, uh, she shall, um, and, and they become one flesh. The Hebrew doesn't say two. It says they shall become one flesh. But Jesus, Christ, but Jesus Christ, as the uh, 
the Son of God with his divine authority is modifying that to become two, to seal off any polygamy. And, to the, and through the history of the Christian church, there has been almost no polygamy and the people who did have been condemned by the bishops and clergy. And not only that, if we go with that, that's clear as day. Jesus is affirming monogamy, saying that was God's standard and norm. He made concessions, but now I'm calling you back to that higher standard. Even if we want to argue, Jesus, that, that wasn't his point. Paul said each man should have his own wife like each woman should have her own husband. Just like a woman can't have multiple husbands, it's, it's reciprocal. A man can't have multiple wives, right? Each man his own wife, each woman her own husband. If Paul is now undoing Jesus' teaching, then you're now left in that dilemma again, Muslims. So <laughs> yeah. Paul hijacked Jesus' teachings, corrupted Jesus' teachings, added to Jesus' teachings, which means that Jesus' message got corrupted, it was lost, and Paul's message dominated, meaning that Paul proved Allah a liar or powerless because Paul's message triumphed over the message of Jesus. So you just destroyed Islam again. And, and, and St. Paul also says in Ephesians 5, a beautiful verse, it compares the husband and wife to Christ and the church, you know. Uh, one church, one husband. One, one, one church, one Christ, exactly. I, I, I also use that uh, for, for, for people like Matthew Vines who try to promote homosexual marriage. It's like Christ and a church. There's not two Christ, there's not two churches. Christ, the church. 100%. So if you want to attack Paul... You again prove the Quran is a lie, either Allah is a liar, or Paul is greater than Allah, more powerful than Allah, because he thwarted Allah's promise to Jesus. Can't get around this dilemma. You're stuck, Muslims. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, no, this is this is good stuff, Sam. You know, <laughs> guys, all my viewers, you need to watch as much of Sam as you can. He does live streams. Uh, he, he's, uh, uh, although to all my Catholic listeners, he, he is Protestant, but I fully endorse his stuff. I fully endorse his stuff. He, he gives, like, I tuned into his, his Bible study today. I got a page of notes. Like, he goes so in-depth. He gives so many good arguments uh, for the deity of Christ, just the st stuff about, um, about Malachi 3.1. Like, that was just... T t to know about this, I'm not going to ask him to get into us now, but watch the live stream from today. Malachi 3.1, then he quotes like, uh, and then so, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he quotes how, and all of those verses make a difference between two persons. It's just brilliant. Guys, I mean. The, the, and please bathe me, my daughters, in your prayers that the Lord will bless us and preserve us and magnify his name through us. For the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I need your prayers for my daughters, and I so appreciate it. So, so, so pray for Sam's daughters. He 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 needs all the prayer. Or pray yeah. for, uh, well, protect him. And and for him to be able to continue his work for 40, 50 more years, because because he is just and um and support him on Patreon. Also, he's got a Patreon. I'll put the link down. I don't ask for any money on my website or on my social media for the work I do. But I do recommend people like Sam. Sam does great work, guys. And just go on Patreon. Tune into his Bible study. There's there's so much good. He gives you a meat of it, you know. And he makes sure that you crossed all the T's dotted on the I's. And he knows the Islamic, on top of knowing the Bible, he knows the Muslim sources better than any apologist out there. Like like Adnan Rashid, you know, pretends to know stuff, but he doesn't know anything about Islam, let alone Christianity. You know, he tries to act that way because he can speak Arabic, but, uh, but he doesn't know anything about the source. Yeah, like, oh, and I, I, I have to plug his video, Sam's videos. They did these so devastating responses to Adnan Rashid. This is about two, three weeks ago, right? David Wood and I on Act 17 Apologetics, I think we did four live streams, Act 17 Apologetics, decimating Adnan Rashid's desperate, pathetic polemics and lies and deceit. <laughs> on... To be honest, it was a decimation. All glory to Jesus. The best was, and, and, and go check it yourself, the best was when they refuted him on Surah 548. That was the icing on the cake. 
Oh, that was so good. Just just go watch it on David Wood's channel. Basically, watch David, watch Sam. There's an our fella named Anthony Rogers who's who, who's almost as good as those two, and uh, there's a few. There's vocab. He although he mainly focuses on the Black Hebrew Israelites. He does some Islamic stuff. He was part of Islamicize me, right? In uh, fact, you know what I would say? Because most of the people you're quoting are Protestant evangelicals. We need more Catholics, Orthodox, even from my church, the Syrian church, to step up and do this work. Yeah, because... Yeah, no, that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. Like, I've, uh, I've done a couple interviews with a guy named Timothy Flanders, who uh, he's a, a, a Catholic, and uh, he... He speaks Arabic. I don't know how well, but he studied it in university, and he's gone to uh, to Egypt and preached uh, preached to the uh, Muslims there. And uh, yeah, so he's a Catholic. I've actually uh, so I've had him on twice. He's a a smart guy. He's got his. We need more Trinitarian soldiers to rise up for the glory of Christ. I know a lot of times Protestants or Catholics are busy refuting each other. Okay. But now you need people who are Trinitarians who love Jesus refuting the non Trinitarian cults and worldviews because the triune God lives and we need to proclaim him in all his glory. Amen. And, and yeah, no. And it's best to know the Bible, know the Quran. Of course, all Christians have Bibles, or you should. And a, a Quran, if you want a Quran, just. Just go to your local mosque, say, oh, I'm interested in Islam, yeah. and they'll give you a crown. That's what I did. There's a mosque like two blocks from me. And so I'm like, oh, I'm interested. They're like, oh, they gave me a crown and all these books. And and so, yeah, no, they're – and so just know that. Know those verses that Sam gave you, like Surah 424. And, um, and I'll send you the links after this in your comment section or on Facebook. So these links to these articles will be available. Please study them. Use them, and I'm giving you permission. Upload them to your websites if you want to, but as long as you use them. Don't just leave them there dormant. If you don't use them, it defeats the purpose. The reason why we're writing them or doing these, to equip you to know and use it to see Muslims get saved, follow along with Jesus, and not just Muslims get saved. Prevent Christians from leaving the faith for Islam. Yeah, and like I know you talked about, like it, it's often there's... Uh, a young female Christian will will run into a, a Muslim guy and and she'll be completely in love with him and no, I've I, seen I shared, it. I shared that story just the other day. It's a true story. It's from Saddle Creek. A young Christian woman from Saddle Creek, Rick Warren's church. I won't mention the name of the parents. Saddleback. Oh, is it? Yeah, Saddleback. Saddle, Saddle, Saddle Creek. Saddle. See, guys, that tells you I don't follow these mega churches. I can be corrected. Yes, Saddleback. I'm sorry, I'm thinking Willow Creek, Saddle Creek. Okay. Young lady was an evangelist, engaged to a Christian young man. They started witnessing to a Muslim. The Muslim young man started sweeping her off her feet. She broke off her engagement with the Christian young man, fell in love with the Muslim, became a Muslim, gave up the faith, devastated her parents, and her father was quite rich. I think he was a millionaire. Married the man, relocated to Jordan, and last I heard, her own father went and bought a home there in Jordan to be close to her. But she gave up the faith. She gave up Jesus Christ. She gave up the Bible because of the love of a man, a Muslim man, even though she was engaged to a Christian. It, it happens. And I promise you, that marriage is going to end. If it hasn't already ended, because I haven't heard from them. But when will it end? When it's too late. When she's got. When I say too late, from God's perspective, there's always a door of repentance. What I'm saying, she's already destroyed her life, earthly-wise speaking. She'll have kids from this man broken and divorced and shamed and humiliated yeah like her the God of mercy. her peak fertile years are going to be wasted God. with this uh God. yeah no so it's a serious thing if you know a female who's who's starting to date or, or maybe looking into dana muslim put them in contact with sam or, or me even i'll do my best i mean just that's a scary thing especially because what i know of arabic people is that they seem to like, this is true of Arabic non-Muslims as well, but they seem to like blonde women. Oh, and, definitely. It's yeah. just like a victory, and it's almost like a, uh, yeah, just let's say victory, because to them, wow, blondies. Because Muhammad himself, that's another thing. 
we have, I have an article on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, exposition of chapter 9, verse 49 of the Quran, where Muhammad enticed his followers to f attack the Byzantines. Why? Because of the blonde woman. He said, you can have the blonde woman. 949. Now, one of the men made an excuse saying he won't go because, you know, he doesn't want to be tempted and he may not be able to control himself. So chapter 9, verse 49 of the Quran was sent down to rebuke him. Okay, now let me... Let me see if I can pull it up right now. Uh, I've got Sahi International here. And among them... 49, what does it say if you want to read it? And among them is he who says, quote, Permit me, in brackets, to remain home and do not put me to trial. Unquestionably, into trial they have fallen and indeed hell will encompass the disbelievers. Now, fallen... There is a, a footnote, and it says, by avoiding their obligation, they fell into destruction. Yes. Now, the reason why that passage was narrated, it's all in my article, is because Muhammad said, if you come and attack the Byzantines, you will get... Here, let me just read one. Okay. Is that the Battle of Tabuk? Tabuk. Yeah, Tabuk. Invade Tabuk, and your spoils will be the daughter of Al-Asfar and the woman of the Romans, Byzantines. Al-Asfar means the yellow, the daughters of the yellow. In other words, look how wicked and immoral Muhammad is. He's saying, hey, we attacked Tabuk, the Byzantines, and you're going to get the blondies as booty. That's what the daughters of Al-Asfar means. Asfar means yellow, the daughters of the yellow. I'm not making it up. Well, and so what the man say, just so you understand what he's saying, Please don't tempt me because I can't control myself. I have strong sexual urges. And Muhammad rebukes him for using that lame excuse. Wow. It's, it's yeah. probably... Well, and and also, the Muhammad's... Uh, well, I suppose th th this is a bit off. But, I mean, uh, keep in mind, it, it was a female who killed Muhammad with, yes, with, with lamb, woman. right? Jewish woman. Jewish He's woman. Said, she even said, she goes, I thought to myself, if you're a prophet, then God would save you. And if you're a king, then we'll get rid of you. And now what's ironic? Muhammad himself claimed that it was the effects of the poison that killed him, that caused him to get ill with the illness that resulted in his death. Now, what did, what did she say? She goes, if you're a prophet, God would save you. Implication, if you're not, he wouldn't. And God didn't save him. Yeah, and it said it felt like his aorta was being cut. I mean, it's like if you hadn't eaten that food, you know, isn't that common sense? You know, you just destroy a village and they feed you food. That's the point. That's what your, your audience needs to know. This was a Jewish woman whom he just got done slaughtering her family you know, and, and her tribe. And then Muhammad was stupid enough to eat a lamb that she cooked. Now, folks, how many of you would go to a home of a woman whose family you just slaughtered, she goes, oh, I'm going to make you a meal. Here's a meal, and I'm serve it up, and you eat it. I mean, you got to be the stupidest human being on the planet. Maybe he was just really hungry after killing all those people, or it's like, oh, some lamb would really hit the spot right now. <laughs> well, it did hit the spot, it resulted <laughs> in his death and the death of his companion. Whoops. Bishop. Yeah. Yep. All right. Awesome. All right, so, uh, Sam, that's... Um... Brother, it was a great time. I enjoyed being here. Anytime you want me to come and talk about any of these issues, I'm here to serve you for the sake of Jesus. And again, pray for miraculous protection from my circumstances, which will go unnamed. The Lord knows them. Pray the Lord will bless me and my daughters to be together. Pray I can serve Jesus in holiness until I die and for the provision. And use the materials. I'll send you the links. Yep. You can then post them for the benefit of your audience, for the glory of Jesus Christ. All right, Sam. Well, thanks for for joining us here or joining me here on AlanReal.com. And uh, yeah, we'll certainly have you back. There's there's so many good topics we can talk to you about here. Amen. All right, God. Indeed. All right, God bless.